Well, thanks everybody for coming to this seminar. And uh, today we're going to, we have Professor Mercury Kanazi this. I hope I, sorry, I've been Kanazi this. So come, come in to give a, give a seminar. And uh, just as a brief, uh, as a very brief bio, and uh, Professor um, Kanazi this had a BS from, from the, from, from Aristotle University in Greece and a PhD degree from chemistry from the University of Iowa. And he's currently a Charles and I'm a Morrison professor of chemistry at Northwestern University. And his research area, among many, I just name a few, including highlight prof guide solid state and coordinated chemistry for charcoal genite compounds and design and synthesis of new material and among quite, quite a few others, and also semiconductor detectors and quantum materials and so on. And he has he has numerous numerous or has received numerous awards, including Royal Chemi Royal Chemical Society, the Genesis Prize in 2015, and also in 2015 the, the EMI Award for Re Renewable Energy Prize category, and the ACS Award in Inorganic Chemistry in 2016, and many others, just to name a few. And this is a very it's a great pleasure to have you to come into talk about your current work. And the topic of this car of this design of this particular presentation is design, prediction, crystal growth, and applications of new semiconductor material, semiconductors for room temperature detection of gamma rays. Okay, then. thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ling Jiang, uh, for this invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, I am a materials scientist, materials chemist, uh, rather than an engineer. Um, and what, what I'm interested in, in creating new materials that would be of use uh, to a number of fields uh, in technology, uh, such as energy conversion, energy detection, environmental remediation, um, and other kinds of things. Uh, and so I want to find a new material that would be uh, the next generation material that can be implemented in a particular discipline. So in this case, my talk is about um, giving you examples of how we try to do this in X-ray and gamma ray detection. Um, it's not easy generally as you know, uh, but uh, you have to work, uh, this is multidisciplinary effort. You have to work with many other talented uh, people in other disciplines. Uh, and so here's my team. Uh, on the left, uh, we have uh, my students and postdocs um, who are outstanding, and my colleague uh, Bruce Wessels, who is in electrical engineering and material science. On the right, uh, we have outside collaborators such as John Hay, Arnold Berger, um, Burek Kursen, and Anton, Anton Tremzin, and many others actually who are not who are not shown here. Um, so we're interested in hard radiation detection. And by that, I mean X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, and there are a number of uh, applications uh, for these kinds of um, capabilities. Uh, one is um, preventative uh, radiological detection. So non-proliferation of smuggled nuclear materials. Uh, astronomy uh, for uh, cosmic radiation. Uh, security inspection, biomedical imaging, um, and many others. Um, and right now there are two ways to detect these kinds of radiation. One is um, a scintillator. Um, it's, it's called an indirect, uh, shown here. The, the scintillator basically scintillates light after absorbing an, a gamma ray, and then that light is detected by other detectors um, like photomultiplier tubes. And, and, it's, and, and, and that's the paradigm for that. But then we have direct detection if you have semiconductors. Um, and the, right now, the direct detection is, is far superior uh, with much higher resolution, but it's more expensive. Indirect detection is cheaper, but it doesn't give as much uh, of a resolution. Um, so uh, today we have uh, one material that has been around for 40 years, and this is the best material for room temperature. Um, by the way, you want to do this detection quickly, easily, and at room temperature. Um, and for that, we only have really one game in town, one material. It's cadmium zinc telluride, which is excellent when it works, but very expensive. 
Uh, so here's some other applications in locating, uh, having portable detectors that can locate um, radio, uh, radioactive and nuclear materials uh, that, uh, that can be anywhere, basically. So we need the portability. Um, and, and so there's a lot of demand for many places, uh, medicine, the government, industry, uh, astronomy, and so on. Uh, so it's a great, a great field, but it's very challenging. So how does this work in the semiconductor? Uh, let's say you have a semiconductor that has a valence band and a conduction band and a band gap. Um, and you want, when there is no radiation, that means in the dark, uh, to have no carriers, that means you have to have very uh, large resistance, very, very high resistivity, uh, so that you don't have any dark current that gets you a lot of noise and prevents you from detecting the radiation. Uh, then, um, if if uh, the, that means the gap has to be big enough so that you don't get thermal excitation uh, by the by ro at room temperature. Uh, if you do, as you see here, if the gap um, is not big enough, you're going to have excitation without radiation in the dark, and you're going to create electrons and holes, and that's going to give you large current. Um, you don't want that. You want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, and, and uh, so you want, uh, you want big, big enough band gap. And then uh, you also, uh, you want um, the gap not to have too many traps from impurities, from imperfections, defects that can capture these, uh, the carriers that are, that are generated uh, when you absorb the radiation. Um, and so you need to have more carriers than traps basically. Uh, and that is easier said than done uh, because uh, you don't have that many carriers generated. And so uh, you have to purify the material extremely well and that raises uh, the cost and lengthens the time. So that's one big uh, problem. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to find something better than CZT uh, and cheaper. Uh, so we want to match or beat the performance uh, of, of CZT. Uh, which has been around for 40 years. So what materials uh, are likely to be good? Uh, one is, uh, so here's some of the criteria, not all of them. We Obviously we need something that has heavy atoms, that has he high density, so that it can absorb the gamma rays. Um, we need dark uh, current to be low, as I mentioned. So we need high resistivities uh, which are at least 10 to the eight, uh, ideally much, much higher. Uh, uh, the band gap should be 1.5 EV or higher. Otherwise you have the, too high of a dark current at room temperature. Um, and uh, the figure of merit of such a material is called the mobility lifetime product. The, in other words, uh, uh, we have to have long lifetime, the carriers and high mobility. And that should be at least 10 to the minus four square centimeters per volt. Um, uh, and so one challenge here is to find such materials uh, that have heavy elements and large band gaps. Uh, normally, if you have a compound that has heavy elements, the gap uh, would be uh, too low for this application. So we came up uh, with uh, some uh, new concepts like dimensional reduction and lattice hybridization that allowed us to predict and select promising new materials uh, that meet all these criteria for, the, uh, for, 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 X, for gamma ray detection. So in this uh, field, uh, there's a, a big problem, big challenge for the properties. What we need is, uh, that's what we call the Bermuda Triangle. We need three properties to be all together in the same material, high resistivity, very high resistivity, very high mobility lifetime product, and good uniformity across the crystal. In other words, uh, low number of defects. Uh, unless you, if one of these three is missing, you are in trouble and you're going down. Um, so uh, the, uh, we came up with chemical concepts that actually allows us to find many, many promising materials. On the left, we have something called dimensional reduction. And this is, uh, we are reducing the dimensionality of the semiconductor uh, by doing chemistry, forming new materials with lower and lower dimensionality. Um, and so the idea here is 
if you start with a, a three-dimensional material that has heavy elements, so it absorbs a lot of gamma rays, but the band gap is too small, so it's useless. You can dimensionally reduce it doing chemistry and make a lower dimensionality. And since these materials also have heavy elements, they will have high uh, absorption for gamma rays, but they will have bigger uh, band gaps uh, because as you lower the dimensionality, you, you narrow the electronic bands and you widen the band gaps between them. And so uh, here's an example. Uh, let's say mercury sulfide. This is uh, mercury sulfide. Mercury is very heavy and it's great. Um, it absorbs a lot of gamma rays, but the band gap is near zero. So it's a metallic material and it's useless. Um, so if you add cesium sulfide and you make a, a series of compounds, uh, as you add more and more cesium sulfide, you get, you're making more and more compounds with lower and lower dimensionality. The first one uh, is made cesium uh, 6267, another one 234, 212, and so on. And from this, now you have much bigger band gaps. The one that is really good is in 1.6 and 2.8. So we select these two for further investigation. On the right, we have something called lattice hybridization. Here we have uh, on, the, on the right, we have uh, a metal calcogenite material like the mercury sulfide, which has heavy elements, but too small a gap. On the right, we have uh, a metal halide that has also heavy elements, but too big a gap. And so if we make compounds that have both calcogenite and halide, we may get structures that have intermediate gap, which is just right. Um, so, Thinking this way, we discovered many promising materials. And in this article, it, there's a long table of recently found materials that are promising for X-rays and gamma ray detection. The, and the materials in the arrows are our materials from our group. Uh, and we have some basic properties. The band gaps are great. These are the band gaps, which are suitable. Uh, the resistivity is suitable. The new tau sometimes is known, sometimes is not, but it's, it's also promising. So now basically we cracked wide open the materials field. And from here, we can select materials for further investigation. That's not enough because we have to investigate them uh, at a deeper level to see if they actually work. Uh, and so from the uh, dimensional reduction, here is some promising compounds. And here's the new tau mobility lifetime products. And you see here, these are quite good and promising. Some are a little bit low, 10 to the minus five. So we can reject them, but others 10 to the minus four, that's, that, that's good enough uh, to do further work. Uh, and this one is high, 10 to the minus three. So it's a productive and useful concept. So let's look at this one. Here's the structure. It's, a three, it's an open crystal structure that has uh, mercury and sulfur, that's heavy. It also has cesium in tunnels in the structure, it has heavy. It's a, it's a direct band gap material uh, of 1.65, and it actually does have strong photocurrent. Uh, that you see here, applied voltage versus photocurrent. We have a nice response. And therefore, we um, did some more work on this. We were able to use the Brisbane method of crystal growth, where uh, you melt the material and you drop it through a temperature gradient. And when it freezes, if you do it right, you may get a large single crystal. It's not as simple, you have to spend some time on it, but it can work. So here's the crystal and it grows. We can get specimens like this. And this one, uh, we can cut it and polish it. Um, and uh, this is the gamma ray response on the right and it's poor. The reason it's poor uh, is, is because it has too high a dark current for gamma rays. And uh, uh, in too many defects. However, it does respond well to x-rays and it is promising for x-ray uh, applications. Here's another one that came out of the lattice hybridization concept, uh, thallium iodide selenide. This is a tetragonal structure, very heavy, has thallium, selenium, and iodine, density of about 7.4. And this is uh, the um, attenuation coefficient versus energy radiation. 
and a comparison of this material with CZT. And it looks like this material is far superior to absorbing X-rays and gamma rays than CZT. So that's good. Uh, we were able to grow large crystals and its resistivity is very high, 10 to the 12, as you see here in this IV curve. It's a tetragonal structure. Uh, here's the electronic structure. It is a semiconductor. This is the valence band. This is the conduction band. And this is the direct band gap. Uh, and so it looks good. Uh, it, has, uh, it has good um, effective, low enough effective masses. So we spent some time on this. And, and, our, and almost 10 years ago, we observed this spectrum, which is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the material being able to observe, to resolve the, the energy of gamma rays, such as uh, cobalt-57 radioactive source, um, and to give us the spectrum of the, of the gamma rays from cobalt. And this, uh, the spectrum in red is, is, is our compound, this new compound. And for comparison, the spectrum uh, in, in black, sorry, in the opposite, the, the red is uh, the, uh, the CCT coming from a commercial spear detector. Uh, so we use this as a benchmark and the black is our material. And it's like, it, it looks excellent, achieving 4.87% uh, resolution, very similar to CZT. Uh, the crystal here was one millimeter thick. So we got very excited about this and we started working uh, very hard. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we could not um, we could not reproduce this uh, this spectrum uh, subsequently, and uh, we worked for another two or three years uh, on this, and um, since 2011, and we were not able to reproduce it, not knowing why, uh, even though we made some very very pure materials, um, and um, and therefore we, then we gave up, unfortunately. Now I have an idea of why this didn't work. Uh, we couldn't reproduce it, and it, it may become obvious later in the talk. Here's another material, uh, thallium uh, tin uh, iodide. Uh, this is a, a, what we call an anti-perovskite perovskite structure. Uh, and uh, this is also promising. Uh, it has very high density, six grams per cubic centimeter, bigger than CZT. Uh, it has uh, very good absorption compared to CZT, uh, and um, uh, it has a band cap of 2.1 EV. So this is great. So we did some work on this. And here's some comparison. Uh, we can grow the crystals uh, quite well. Very sensitive to x-rays. This is x-ray response uh, between uh, uh, off, x-rays off, x-rays on. Very, so it looks like very rapid response. Uh, with very high on-off ratio um, and uh, a very low dark current uh, with resistivity of about 10 to the 10th uh, ohm centimeters. Um, and so here is uh, uh, the IV curve in the presence of X-rays. And so in, the, in this direction, which is uh, we're detecting electrons and in the backward direction, we're detecting holes. And uh, we can uh, calculate uh, the, the, the mu tau for electrons uh, from this data, which comes out to about 10 to the minus three, which is uh, very good. Uh, and the holes, uh, on the other hand, um, are uh, very poor, uh, clo uh, maybe close to 10 to the minus four. But nevertheless, this is a promising material uh, that requires more, uh, more work. Uh, the electron mobility that we measure um, in this material is about 100 square centimeters per volt second. Uh, we tested this material for gamma rays, and this is what we got. It, it, indeed, it counts gamma rays, and these are the spectra uh, collected as a function of applied voltage across the crystal. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is we cannot resolve the photo peak. Uh, we cannot resolve the energy of the gamma rays uh, here using cobalt radiation. Uh, so this may be promising with more work. It could uh, make it to resolve a, the gamma rays. Um, so one thing to point out here is uh, the new tau um, may be dependent, uh, is dependent on the number of photo excited carriers. So in terms of how many uh, photons you have when you test for gamma rays versus X-rays versus visible light, um, it varies by orders of magnitude. 
In other words, uh, gamma ray sources typically have 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 11 photons per square centimeter. Um, and um, X rays have uh, another three orders of magnitude more. And visible light has uh, another two or three uh, orders more photons. What, mean, what this means is that if you have very few, you have to have very few uh, trapping centers to be able to detect the gamma rays because uh, if you have, uh, if your trapping centers are comparable in number to the number of uh, photons falling in, uh, which means uh, the number of carriers generated are also comparable in number, um, you may get low, low response because a lot of trapping. But this situation may improve on the same material if you have x-rays because you have more photons and therefore more electrons uh, in principle than, than the trapping centers uh, that you may have. And so uh, in that case, you may see better response. And with visible light, it's always easy, even more photons, uh, and you can always overcome the number of trapping centers. Uh, and so this is a thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, the, the mu tau may be uh, changing as a function of a uh, number of carriers. Now, Back in 2012, we published a paper um, in Nature uh, using this perovskite material, cesium tin iodide, as a semiconductor for a solar cell material. Uh, and, and we published 10% efficiency. This was the first paper reporting on a solid state solar cell using a perovskite material and surprised everyone. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that was uh, in May of 2012. And then three or four months later, a number of other groups published similar papers um, with similar efficiencies or higher uh, using also perovskites as well. And that really started the revolution in the field of perovskite uh, photovoltaics, um, which to this day has resulted in efficiencies of over 26%, which is remarkable uh, uh, and is higher than any other uh, material, including silicon. Uh, so why were these materials so good? It's because they had very long lifetimes, despite the fact that they were not really that perfect and they were not really that pure. In other words, they were defect tolerant. Um, and um, we thought about, okay, uh, this is great. That's what we need. We don't want to make something extremely pure um, where it could take us years to accomplish. We want something that actually works despite the fact that it's not extremely pure. Um, and this, uh, this, the class of perovskites gave us an opportunity to look at new semiconductors that are defect tolerant. This particular compound, cesium lead bromide, uh, was attractive for our uh, radiation detection application, not so much solar energy devices, so photovoltaics. Uh, why? Because uh, it has a band cap of 2.2 uh, phi dV. That means you will have low resistivity in the dark at room temperature. Uh, its density is uh, not very high, but not very low, 4.8. Um, so it's still acceptable. It melts uh, at a reasonable temperature, 567 degrees C. And I, I point that out because the CZT melts at twice the temperature. It melts at about 11 1200 degrees C, and that complicates the crystal growth substantially. Um, and, um, and, and so this is the structure. The perovskite has octahedral uh, lead atoms uh, surrounded by uh, a, an octahedron of bromine atoms. Uh, basically, the octahedra then share corners uh, to make a three-dimensional structure. And then in the cages that form, you have the cesium atom. Uh, and so it's a simple structure, but it's also complicated in the sense that these octahedra are dynamic and they begin to, uh, they can rotate back and forth, giving rise to uh, phase transitions like you see here. Uh, for example, this material, it's orthorhombic at room temperature because the octahedra in this view, you can see they have been rotated compared to high temperature where you see the octahedra uh, are not rotated and these angles, the lead bromine lead angle are straight. This is the ideal structure. And then when you cool it down, you get a rotation uh, of the octahedra becomes tetragonal, then further rotation becomes orthorhombic. 
This is a phase transition. Normally phase transitions, when you try to grow crystals are not desirable. Uh, actually, they, they are bad news. In this case, uh, these transistors are mild and they're not catastrophic. Uh, and uh, so they give you a material that is twinned, but it, it, it can still work. Uh, it's electronic structure is excellent. You see here, this is a calculation. Uh, this is the valence band. This is the conduction band. It's a direct gap. And they have a very nicely dispersed electronic bands, which is good uh, for electron and hole mobility. So this material is defect tolerant. Uh, this is how it compares. Uh, this is the mass absorption coefficient uh, as a function of energy. Uh, and the, uh, the, red, the red line is what we're looking at in this energy range is better than CCT. Um, and, and therefore that's a, that's a very positive uh, feature. Um, so that means uh, you don't have to make the crystal as, as thick. All right, just to summarize then, in all the, the past uh, 10 years, we, we discovered and investigated many, many materials. Um, and then we down selected based on how promising its material was. So we put them through a funnel basically, and we started eliminating one after another um, uh, in terms of how promising they were. And in the end, uh, this material sort of turned out to be the best so far uh, that we were able to uh, achieve high resolution uh, spectrum for gamma rays. Um, so uh, our criteria were, for example, growability. Is it easy to grow? Is it congruent melting? Does it decompose? Does it have mechanical strength? How pure is it? Uh, we did impurity analysis. Is it stable in air? Uh, what is the band gap? Um, um, what are the likely crystal defects and so on? Uh, and this was uh, some of our criteria. I'm saying all of these materials that we eliminated, it doesn't mean they are useless. I think we left a lot of good materials on the table because we had to focus and, then, and, and we had limited resources. We can, may still go back and look at some of these materials. So, all right, so we focused on this. Uh, this is how we make it, cesium bromide plus lead bromide. Uh, we heat it up in a, a high temperature. We can also do it from solution because these are soluble. Uh, this is the original material we made in 2013. And by today's standards, it doesn't look very good at all. Um, uh, and this, uh, we made a big progress uh, since 2013. So why is the defect, uh, why is the, the perovskite defect tolerant? Um, that's because uh, unlike, so unlike uh, a conventional semiconductor, like gallium arsenide, like cadmium telluride, um, which when it has defects like vacancies and, and other things, it creates deep level uh, states in the, in the gap, uh, which act as traps and kill the signal. This material, when it has the same kinds of um, defects, it doesn't create deep level states. Either they are uh, they form uh, they are shallow, very close to the band edges, which is good. They don't they are not as harmful in that case, or they go well inside the band, uh, in, in which case uh, they're not really um, uh, they're not affecting tra charge transport. Uh, so this is one of the reasons uh, that they are defect tolerant. So back in 2013, we published this paper for the first time identifying this material being promising for high energy radiation detection. And we published this IV curves uh, and with resistivity that was not very impressive about uh, almost like 10 to the eight ohm centimeter, but it was photoactive. This is the laser on, this is laser off. So it was photoresponsive with, uh, with laser light. However, look at the gamma ray response, almost nothing um, with dark and with the gamma rays on, no response. So it wasn't good, but it did, it did have X-ray response. Uh, and we see here, we're counting X-rays of silver, which is about 24 keV. Uh, and that's it. that is what made us think that this material would be promising for that. Um, so uh, then we went back to the lab and started purifying uh, the compound. Um, and um, 
we uh, we can make, for example, a high quality cesium bromide and lead bromide, starting from uh, say cesium uh, carbonate or, or lead nitrate or lead acetate, and we use very pure uh, hydrobromic acid, uh, and we can precipitate these materials. Then we filter them, and then we put them inside a tube and heat them up so that we can evaporate them from one side to another and leave behind the impurities, we sublime it and get very high quality material. Then we use that to do to combine them and do the reaction to give us uh, the cesium lead bromide that you see here. Uh, uh, we can, uh, it's a, we can, this is done in solution. We can filter the solution. We can treat it with HPR gas uh, to remove water. Uh, and then uh, we can put it in a, uh, in a tube uh, where we can melt it. And then uh, we have a, frit, a filter and we can pass the melt from this side to that side. And you can see, even though this is a, a, a very nice reaction, it doesn't seem like it has too many impurities, but the material, even when we melt it, it still has a lot of black stuff. Then we filter it, we remove it, we take this, and we use it um, uh, either to do zone refining or we can use it directly to grow a, a large crystal. This is several, this is six or seven centimeters um, of material. So th this is the Brisman crystal. We can then grow it. And you see here, uh, we pass it through a temperature differential. Uh, it's high temperature in the top, low temperature in the bottom. We control the gradient and the material begins to freeze as it's coming down. Uh, this temperature is below the melting point and this is above the melting point. And um, uh, if you optimize the conditions, you can get a nice crystal that looks like this. See, we have a crack here. We have another crack here, but for the most part it's a nice material. And you see this part is uh, more dark than this part. So that tells you that a further purification has gone on to put a lot of the impurities to the top. So this can be removed and uh, then you have a nice material. We, uh, you can do the same for the chloride uh, and in fact get a nice looking material there as well. So then you can take these crystals uh, and cut them and polish them um, to size uh, to make detectors or for further characterization. And you see here uh, some of the examples uh, that, that we have. Uh, these, uh, uh, these, are, <coughs> these are millimeters, so we can make more than one centimeter diameter and many millimeters uh, long. Um, of any size, basically, you can, uh, you can think of. These tubes are independent uh, Brisbane growth uh, runs, uh, and this is the scale. You see here we have very large scale, and also we can increase the diameter uh, of the crystal as well. So one, one concern is um, uh, how good is the material across the crystal? So this is a, a study where we cut um, crystals, slices like a salami uh, along, the, along the ingot, and then we measure the, the IV current and you see here, there, yes, there is some variation uh, from, uh, from the bottom this, uh, and then um, to the top, but more or less, I think is a reasonable, reasonable variation from top to bottom. Uh, and and, and the, same, the same thing is uh, shown here. So um, the high quality material, we have about 10 to the, uh, uh, we'll give you uh, about, uh, uh, 10 to the minus 9 amps uh, to 10 to the minus 10 amps uh, resistance. Low quality material would be worse by one or two orders of magnitude. So, uh, so you can use that to assess. So in fact, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the right, we have another, another ingot uh, where, where we have, you see here, 10 to the minus 6 current amps. So this is a bad quality material. On the left, 10 to the minus nine, three orders of magnitude uh, higher. Uh, and so this is a high quality material. Uh, this, it, it corresponds to this, the original, 
material, which doesn't look very good from 2013. This is the more recent. Uh, so then uh, we put electrodes on this material to try to make detectors. And so first we did uh, what we always did, uh, put gold on both sides of the crystal. Um, and um, uh, we obtained this IV curve, uh, which uh, gives us about, uh, say at minus 50, it gives about uh, minus 30 nanoamps. And then it goes down. If you go minus 100, it goes way down. So you, by the time you get to 100 volts, 200 volts, or 300 volts applied, you get a very high dark hour. We believe anything above 100 nanoamps is very high. And this detector that has gold on both sides does not work, um, did not give us any response. Um, at first, we thought the material was not good. Um, and we tried, we spent a lot of time trying to make it better. However, it, we then re realized that this high current may not be because the material is not good, but because um, um, if you look at the energy difference between uh, the gold work function and the valence band position and conduction band position of the perovskite, we realized that um, in the gold on one direction has very, very low barrier. And in the other direction, as we bias it, it has very high barrier. Um, so no matter how we bias this thing, one side has low barrier uh, energy and it injects electrons. And this was, the, uh, this was the source of the high current, not because the material was not good. Um, so then we realized, let's make a device that, uh, uh, so this is the, the energy shown here, the energy diagram shown here. This is gold and gold on both sides. And this is the energy of the valence band and the energy of the conduction band. So you see what, uh, we have this uh, small energy on this, on this side, but big energy on that side. So then we did this, we changed one side and put a lower work function metal like gallium, because uh, now the energy of the gallium work is here. And we have this asymmetric electrode. So when we bias this one way, both of, the, both of the barriers are small and we get very high current. We call this the forward direction. But when we bias it the other way, both barriers are high and this is the reverse direction. And now we have very low dark time. And it was this particular configuration that actually um, uh, we call this asymmetric uh, configuration uh, as opposed to symmetric. Uh, is the one that gave us uh, uh, the good detector, uh, which you see here. Here you see spectra, uh, result spectra from an, an americium gamma ray source, which emits gamma rays at 59.5 keV. We can resolve this peak. Uh, this is the cobalt source, which emits at 122 keV and 136 keV. We can also resolve that. So this was great. We were very excited to see that. Uh, and this was reproducible. And this is basically the charge collection efficiency as a function of voltage. We have very nice uh, reaching almost 100% efficiency after about uh, 60 uh, volts. Um, we measure the, uh, uh, the drift velocity and calculate the mobility, which is about 50 uh, square centimeters meters per volt seconds. Uh, these are the spectra here as a function of uh, uh, time. We, uh, we're counting for uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and so on. We get more and more counts. And um, these are, um, uh, this is the dependence of the nominal energy uh, of the gamma ray source, uh, like americium, cobalt, and other sources, versus the measured energy, and we have very nice, beautiful linear dependence. And that's what you want to see. Uh, so here's how the, spec, uh, how the, how the material uh, compares with CZT. Uh, the red spectrum is our material. The blue spectrum is CZT, commercial, commercially, a planar detector. Uh, and you see here is almost identical. Uh, the resolution is close to about 4.5% or 4%. Um, we can also detect uh, uh, with this planar detector uh, the, uh, the gamma rays of cesium-137, which are much more energetic and more penetrating at about 662 kV, see here. 
Uh, and again, you see a very linear response between uh, the energy of the gamma ray or from different elements and, and what we see the photo peak here. Uh, the, we can calculate the mu tau products, uh, which are very close uh, to uh, this one, uh, close to one, uh, 10 to the minus three, and the whole 10 to the minus, uh, a little sli uh, slightly higher, 10 to the minus three. I need to uh, point out that these spectra are uh, collected with uh, hole collections, right? We're measuring the holes, not the electrons. Um, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, spectrum, if we try to measure the electrons instead, uh, we do not get as good a resolution. So this is a unlike CCT, where one measures uh, the electron response. Here we measure the whole response. That's a big difference. Uh, we also uh, uh, figure uh, that the whole lifetime is very very large, uh, or more than 125 microseconds. So uh, this material is very um, dynamic. Um, and this is, I think, the origin of why the carrier lifetime is so long and why it's defect tolerant. Uh, basically, what you see here is Raman spectra uh, of this material um, at low, low frequencies. Um, and this is compared with methyl ammonium and other analog and organic, inorganic material similar. Uh, and basically, this, uh, this red spectrum is very broad. Um, and uh, it looks like this Raman spectrum of a liquid, um, suggesting that even though this is a crystal, the crystalline lattice uh, is so dynamic, uh, things are rotating and, and, and moving around uh, to, to give this liquid-like response. Uh, and, and the way this happens is the octahedra rotate, the metal, uh, which is at the center of the octahedron, goes off center. And the cesium, which is in the cage, also goes off center. So it's very dynamic at room temperature. And I believe because of that, when we make electrons and holes, they get lost uh, among, uh, and they cannot find each other soon enough to recombine. And that lengthens the lifetime. And therefore, we have a chance to collect the signal. Here's an example. We made a, an even uh, bigger crystal. Uh, uh, close to just under an inch. Uh, and uh, this is the response that we got from three different parts of the ingot. Um, as you see here, in all cases, we do resolve uh, the cobalt spectrum, the cobalt 57, 122 kV uh, spectrum uh, with, a, with good resolution. Here's 5.8, 6.6, .6, 7.8. These are planar detectors. We made so this is quite promising material actually uh, for, uh, for for many applications. We then made pixelated detectors, um, and with pixelated detectors, one can actually control better the the applied field inside the crystal. Um, and uh, this is a basically a very um, small two by two uh, pixelated detector. In other words, it has four pixels. Um, <coughs> And uh, this was done in collaboration with Professor John Hay at the University of Michigan. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we got uh, much better resolution than before. So the planar detector uh, shown here uh, is detecting cesium gamma rays like 622 kV. Uh, and this is the spectrum. And this is good resolution for a planar detector. About one, uh, but then when we make the pixelated uh, detector, the resolution went down um, for each pixel um, to about 1.4, 1. 1.44%. 1. And so this was also very exciting uh, because it points the way to larger detectors and more desirable detectors for uh, particular applications. Uh, this was published recently in Nature Photonics. Uh, so here's the summary of some of the leading materials, uh, actually the leading materials uh, uh, from the commercialization point of view. We, so there are not that many. Uh, one is cadmium telluride, which is the parent of cadmium zinc telluride, the parent of CZT. Uh, what's wrong with cadmium telluride? Uh, the band gap is too low, 1.44. It has very good mobilities uh, for electrons, um, very good mutaos, but reasonably low 
resistivity uh, and high melting point. Um, this is not, it's good for X-ray detection, um, but not for gamma ray detection. When you put a little bit of zinc in the structure, the band gap goes up from 1.4 to 1.6. Now this is high enough to get higher resistivity. Uh, the mobilities are not affected significantly. And this is the material actually that made it to commercialization for gamma rays. Cadmium telluride is used for X-rays um, in, in a limited fashion. Uh, thallium bromide has been a contender for several decades, uh, and it has given uh, excellent uh, radiation response uh, to gamma rays. It has uh, it has a very wide gap, two point seven. Uh, its mobility lifetime products are a little bit low, but it's improving. Uh, however, this material um, has, is very soft and it, and it generates defects very easily, and it's not defect tolerant. Uh, so the detectors have problems after they are made. Um, and then uh, not, there's nothing else except our material here, the perovskite, which has a, a gap of 2.28. It has a uh, mobilities of about 50 or 60 for both holes and electrons. Uh, the mu taus are also 10 to the minus 3. Actually, we have much higher values now. Resistance of 10 to the 9 or, uh, and higher, and a very low, a nice, reasonable melting point. So I think this is quite promising as a, as a viable next generation radiation detection. And it also has lower cost uh, because uh, it's easier to grow. The materials are cheaper. Cadmium and tellurium are very expensive because they are five nines or six nines pure. Um, our material is cheaper and uh, uh, more of the material is usable. Um, I just want to make, uh, to make a point here. If this was CZT, if this crystal was CZT, only a small part would be good, great detector quality. The rest would not be as good and will have to be not used or discarded. Whereas here we think uh, much more of the ingot, if not all of it, would be usable. And so that also drops the cost. We use the same asymmetric uh, electrode device to demonstrate uh, other perovskites that can also detect radiation, such as this methyl ammonium lead iodide. And we can grow these crystals, not by Brisman, because it, it decomposes, but by solution growth, you see very large crystals are possible. Uh, and that works too. It's not as good as cesium lead bromide. And also the cesium lead chloride, we just published uh, a month ago. Uh, and we managed to also detect a gamma ray spectra. As you see here, we have photo peak. The resolution is much lower at about 16%. Uh, the band of this material is a little bit higher than we would like it to be. That's why it is almost colorless, light, light yellow, but it does have a lot of promise as well. And uh, we haven't done a lot of work on this material yet. Uh, we hope to do more so and evaluate it for X-ray detection in the future. Uh, so here's our progress. We identified this material in 2013. It was not very good. It couldn't respond to gamma rays. We improved the synthesis and the chemistry and the crystal growth, we got much higher quality material, but even that was not good enough to give us uh, energy resolution in our gamma ray response. And at this point, I don't know if it was the material still not good enough or we were using symmetric electrode. And so we had the wrong, uh, the wrong electrode. That's a mystery. Uh, but when, once we figured out the electrode, we were able to break it open and, and get spectral resolution. Uh, as good as uh, CZT on a one-to-one -one comparison, uh, and then the pixelation. Now we are working on making uh, more and more pixelated detectors with higher number of pixels and, uh, and characterizing in collaboration with uh, John He. And also we, we uh, now started to collaborate with Professor Ling Jiang in your department um, uh, to be able to evaluate this crystal for uh, X-ray detection for uh, single photon uh, uh, medical radiation um, imaging, uh, counting uh, single photon um, uh, computed tomography. Uh, 
And, and so we also um, started a, a new company um, a couple of months ago called Actinia in trying to scale this material up, perfect its, uh, its quality and, and, and commercialize it for various applications. With this, I'd like to thank you for, the, uh, for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there uh, in person, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions from the students or the faculty. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk. And I'm very, very uh, excited after so many years, so much effort have been by the field, I've been searching in the searching for new material and finally I have something coming up. Really, it's a, it's a very long journey. You know it by <laughs> almost end of this. Anyway, so this is great. So um, we, we have time for a few questions, so. Uh, any any question from our audience? Well, maybe I, I was throwing a question. I was throwing a question just to just to start. So uh, this uh, cesium light bromide is known to is is charge transport is relatively slow. Um, do you what is the what is the fundamental reason? I think the same reason that I explained why the electrons and holes do not recombine very uh, quickly because of the uh, lattice, liquid-like lattice character of the, all the vibrations that are occurring. Uh, we, I'm not talking about the standard vibrations that occur in every crystal. I'm talking about rotations and, and things moving around a lot. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on that are being studied by many groups uh, from, with many techniques. Um, that particular um, character gives long lifetime, but limits the mobility because mobility wants perfect stiff lattice like silicon uh, to be able to, to sort of have high mobility. And I think that's, I mean, um, it gives you a gift by giving you long lifetimes, but it doesn't give you very long um, carrier mobilities because of that. Now, there are, there are reports, there are claims by other groups including our own claim uh, in 2013, uh, we, we used a method that is probably not very suitable to get mobility. We used Hall effect, which is the standard method to measure mobilities. But that method works when you have doped material and a decent number of carriers. When you have carriers that are in the order of 10 to the 10th per, per cubic centimeter, the Hall effect is, is very challenging. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, there are other groups, including us in the original publication, who are claiming mobility is over a thousand. I am skeptical about that. I wish this is correct. I wish there is a version of the crystal or a quality of the crystal that would give you that much. Um, but all the measurements we did, which I trust now in the last uh, three or four years, they all point to something like between 40 and 100, depending on the quality of the crystal. I'm wondering, is there, and so having a faster response will certainly be welcoming for, welcome for x-rays for any, any high flux measurements and so on. Is there any, uh, any way that people identified that the mobility can be improved with this particular material? One thing I'd like to know now, uh, not, not yet, uh, I'd like to know, uh, for example, is the, does the mobility depend on the carrier number? Normally in classical semiconductors, uh, the more you dope it and the more carriers you have, the mobility drops. Uh, there is some theory here that predicts uh, that in this material, the more carriers you have, the mobility will go up. Um, I don't know why, I have an intuitive feeling that it, why it might go uh, up, but uh, I need to understand this better. But uh, if that's the case, I, I would like to look in that direction, uh, try to find a method. I don't know what method to use to, um, to, to estimate a, a photo excited carrier mobilities for hole and electron as a function of photon flux, because the more photon flux, the more carriers, and, and, uh, and then we want to know what the mobilities are. Um, that would give us a very good idea of if there is a chance to make the mobilities higher or not. Yeah, well, great, very promising. Um, any other questions from, from the audience? Uh, I have one question. 
Um, thank you for the uh, nice seminar talk. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe certain uh, other perovskites used for this purposes, I think organ uh, with the, the methyl um, organic had some material, uh, they didn't last very long. They would degrade relatively quickly. Um, has there been enough time and uh, uh, looking into these materials, whether they go upon the same degradation or do they last quite a long time? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, this is a big issue, stability in perovskites. Um, that question uh, applies to even the, the, the solar cell devices. Um, oh, most of which are, um, are using organic, inorganic perovskite, as you said, methyl ammonium. Uh, um, so ours is all inorganic and generally all inorganic materials are much more stable than something that has an organic molecule inside. We have a detector in fact, the detector we, um, we published in 2018 um, is still there, still alive, and we measure it from time to time, and it's still working. And so this is now over three years. So the detector we made in uh, 2017, basically, we published the paper in 2018, but we started measuring before that. That detector is still there, and uh, it, performs, uh, it performs very well, it's stable. So uh, over three years, we think this material is gonna be stable in the long term. Okay, great. Any further questions? Oh, okay. Well, uh, if we don't have questions, well, let's uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so thank much you for coming much. to the seminar and it's great talk. Thanks for the okay. invitation. Yes. Have a good have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye bye then.